All right, hello everybody. Welcome here to Summit Church and uh, everyone in the congregation. Welcome everyone on social media. Glad you've joined us today. Hey, we've been studying about the kings of the Old Testament and learning lessons from their lives. And uh, I'm not going to review today. Uh, if you've missed any of the previous sessions, you can go into our, into our archives and, uh, and catch up on anything you may have missed. But some fascinating lessons uh, that we've been learning about the kings of the Old Testament, things that we, we've learned, things we, we should do and things we shouldn't do. And it's always uh, easier, I think, to learn from other people's mistakes and not make those same mistakes ourselves. And we can see what, what they, these kings did that, that made them successful and, and, uh, and, and then do those things ourselves and it'll make us successful, you know. So anyway, let's continue. Today we have one of the... the Best kings of all, one of the best kings of all, maybe the best one of all, uh, possibly, arguably, uh, King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah of Judah, and remember there was Israel in the north, Judah in the south, and he, he was a good king, and uh, he was the son of King Ahaz, who we studied last week, who was an evil king, who was one of the most evil kings. And remember a lesson we've been learning here is that just because you have a, a uh, just 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 because you have a good father doesn't mean you're going to have a good son, and vice versa. You know, just because you have an evil father doesn't mean you're going to have an evil son. We've seen that lesson all throughout here. Uh, 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 King Ahaz was just evil, and he produced a very good, godly son, and. Uh, and so, so again, a word of encouragement. If you're a real good parent out there and our parents and, and you've, you know, you, you've done everything you know to do to raise your children right and they're, they're not serving the Lord, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't be hard on yourselves. You, we see in these kings, you had, you had, uh, you know, good kings that produced evil, evil sons and, and the kings were good. They did right things, but the sons turned out evil and, uh, 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 remember, ultimately, it's a decision of one's heart how someone is going to live. And, uh, uh, but, but hold on to this. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Hold on to that. But, uh, but so anyway, you have good kings produce evil sons. Evil kings, good sons. Sometimes a good king, a good son. An evil king, an evil son. Have I made the point clear? <laughs> so I said, move on. Let's go. Okay. So anyway, Hezekiah came to the throne in the wake of his father's idolatry and disastrous reign, which again we talked about last week. Judah under Ahaz had become a vassal nation to Assyria, subservient to Assyria. And that's what all of uh, 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 Ahaz uh, last week talked about him. That's what all of his sin produced. It produced bondage. And that's what sin will produce is bondage. Remember, if you go back before Ahaz into, I believe it was Jotham and Uzziah, they sought the Lord and it produced liberty and prosperity. But then Ahaz came along and uh, remember, uh, he, he did terrible things. He, he, he sacrificed his children to Molech, you know, and burned them in the fire. He shut down the temple of God and and it produced bondage. And, and so uh, Judah became subservient to Assyria. And uh, uh, anyway, so Hezekiah comes to the throne. And uh, in the first month of his reign, here's what he did. Here's what Hezekiah did. A good king. He reopened the temple doors that his father Ahaz had closed. So that's a good thing. He opened up we would say he opened up church. He opened the churches back up. He opened up the temple, okay? So that's a good thing. The temple had been closed and Hezekiah opened it back up. And he also assembled the priests and the Levites and commissioned them to sanctify themselves for service and to cleanse the temple. The temple, uh, a, a lot of uh, things had been brought in there. We talked to you last week how Ahaz brought in that altar, you know. He got rid of all of the furniture of God and just, he kept one piece. Remember that? And he brought in all this terrible altar that he sacrificed on. Well, Hezekiah cleaned it out, cleaned that, cleaned that all out, got rid of all of the, uh, the, the demonic, worldly things, and... Uh, uh, and, and that was a good thing, a total house cleaning, 
a total house cleaning of all the demonic worldly evil his father Ahaz had allowed. You know the United States needs a good house cleaning. Did you know that? And it needs to start in the house of God. I mean, in, in the pulpits of, not all of the pulpits of America, but so many pulpits of America, as I said last week, they've gotten rid of every, they've, they've pushed God out. They, they've kept just a, maybe one Bible verse here or there, but they've gotten rid of everything else just about that's, that's of the Lord. And uh, it's become very worldly. They'll keep just enough scripture in there to, to, uh, to say they're Bible-based, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's very sad. You can't tell the difference between many churches in America, you know, and nightclubs and whatnot. The entertainment gospel, if you want to call it that, prevails. And it's, it's very sad. One of the reasons the nation is in the trouble that it's in. And, uh, but, but, but the nation could use a good house cleaning. Uh, and in the churches, not all the churches, there's lots of good churches out there, but I'm talking mainly about some of these most successful media ministries. I mean, you look in there and you can't tell, have you tuned in to see church or have you tuned in to the voice, you know, on Monday? You know what I mean? The atmosphere, the worldly atmosphere is the same. A church ought to be a church where the presence of God is, you know. And so the, 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 the nation could use a, a good house cleaning like Hezekiah we need some Hezekiahs to rise up in the nation. We need some spiritual Hezekiahs and we need some political Hezekiahs, you know, to raise up in the land and just clean house and, and, and tell the truth, the whole truth with nothing but the truth, you know, and uh, so on and so forth. But that's what Hezekiah did. He came to, to power and he had a good house cleaning and he, he, he opened up the church. He got rid of all the, 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 the stuff that his father had brought in and he brought back in God. He brought back in the things of God, you know, that's what we need in the church, bring back in the things of God, you know, and uh, I, I tell you what, I wouldn't go to a church where the pastor never asks you to open your Bible, if the pastor's never asking you to open your Bible, you're in the wrong church, you know, Amen. I said if the pastor never asks you to open your Bible or, or turn to your Bible on your phone or some other way, you're in the wrong church, Amen. I said you're in the wrong church. Amen. I said you're in the wrong church. We need to be going to the Bible, not just a verse here or there once in a while, but a good house cleaning. I'm telling you, we need a good house cleaning, just like Hezekiah did. And uh, uh, But be that as it may, he reinstituted and celebrated the Passover with Judah, and he invited Israel, you know, in the north to join. And, uh, 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 and, and so what happened was there was a great and mighty celebration and revival in the land. I tell you what, you, if you want, if you, I tell you what, if you want revival in the United States, the churches need a good house cleaning. Now, I'm not standing here being judgmental. Let, let the judgment start with me. But I tell you what, uh, 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 if you want revival in the United States, it needs a good house cleaning. The pulpits need to start proclaiming the word of God with power and authority in the name of the Lord Jesus and, and preach the word of God. And men of God not being afraid of man or beast, you know, but, but saying, thus saith the Lord and preaching the word of God. I tell you what, that would affect the nation greatly. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you this, uh, I've said this before, I'll say it again, preachers shouldn't be taking orders from Washington. Washington ought to be listening to the preachers, you see. Amen. You understand that? And uh, men of God ought to be men of God. And you want a revival in this nation? I tell you what, it starts in the pulpits of America and then it has to spread out to the people. And then the people have to love the Bible and the bread of the word of God more than they love Krispy Kreme donuts. Glory to God. And you understand what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and, more, than they, and more than they love the lattes, you see. And uh, you understand in the Starbucks. And love the word of God more than that. Let that spread out beyond the four walls of the church and start affecting local communities and then into the cities and towns and so forth and let it just go through the nation. I tell you, it's the only hope the nation has, you see. I'm talking about the United States. We need some Hezekiahs, you see. And, uh, and great revival came to Judah. Great revival. I mean, it had, it had fallen into darkness and, uh, under, under his father. And his father's gone now. And now he rises up in the power of God and he starts cleaning house. 
And uh, he instituted, the, Hezekiah instituted the most sweeping religious reforms of all the kings before or after him. And as a result, during his 29 year reign, he was successful in everything that he did. No, and it was no small accomplishment given the very difficult times during which he reigned. Now notice 2 Kings 18, 2 Kings 18. Let's go there. I'm going to read some verses out of the New Living Translation. 2 Kings 18, verse 1 says, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, began to rule over Judah in the third year of King Hosea's, uh, Hosea's reign in Israel. He was 25 years old when he became king. So that's how old Hezekiah was when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years and then his mother's name is given. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the pagan shrines, smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. Now look at this next thing that he did. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Remember in the uh, wilderness when the fiery serpents came in as a result of the people grumbling and complaining against Moses and the, and the spiritual authority? I tell you what, be careful about grumbling and complaining against good spiritual authority that God has set you under. Be careful about that. But that's what happened, you know, under Moses. Remember the fiery serpents came into the camp and bit the people. And so God had Moses take a, and make a bronze brass serpent, you know, and put it on a pole. And everyone who intently looked upon that, if they were bitten with, with, with a poisonous snake, they did not die. Remember that? But you know what? You can make a God out of anything. You shouldn't, but you can. I've watched people make gods out of all kinds of things. In 27 years of pastoring, I've watched people make gods out of all kinds of things. And I could give you a list. And if I went through the list, we wouldn't have time to finish the sermon. So just suffice it to say, you can make a god out of anything. And what the people had done in the process of time, they had taken this bronze serpent and they'd made a god out of it and they started worshiping it. And they worshiped it and they worshiped it. Can you imagine that? They worshiped it and they worshiped it. And, uh, and they'd made an idol out of it. Be watchful. You can make an idol out of anything. Don't let anything become an idol to you, you know. And uh, don't put anything ahead of Almighty God. But that's what these people had done over, over, over time as time went on. And Hezekiah, he rose up and he broke that bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. In fact, they even gave it a name. I mean, think about that. They call it Nehushtan. They, they gave it a name. But Hezekiah had that broken. Glory to God. He got he got rid of that. And, uh, 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 you know, some body might have come to him and said, oh, but don't you know, Moses had that made, you know, at the direction of the Lord and all of that. He, I don't know that anybody said that to Hezekiah, but somebody might have said that to him. You know, and we've always worshiped that. We've always had that there. We blah, 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 blah. I tell you what, Hezekiah did the right thing. Can you say amen? Yeah. I mean, you know, Moses had it made at the direction of God, but it was there to bring deliverance to people not to worship, you see. And, and, and so uh, uh, Hezekiah had that thing busted up. Praise God. I'm glad he did. And then notice verse five. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. Now, that'd be that'd be good to have that written about you in the Bible, wouldn't it? He remained faithful to the Lord in everything. He carefully obeyed all the commands of the Lord that the Lord had given him. I'm sorry, that the Lord had given Moses. So the Lord was with him, with Hezekiah. And uh, Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. And then notice here, he revolted. Can you see why he was successful? Yes. And then it says he, because he, he was cleaning house, he was being righteous, he was doing what God wanted done. But then it says he revolted against uh, the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute. Yep. Now this is a good thing that he did. Yes. Because you see his father, because of the evil of his father and the idolatry of his father, uh, uh, Judah had been taken over, if you will, or uh, taken over is not really the right word, but they had become subservient to Assyria. They'd become a vassal nation to Assyria. And Hezekiah rose up and said, we're not paying you off no more. We're not giving you any. We're not paying you no money no more. We're not doing that. That's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. Very good thing. And uh, uh, but uh, so he did that. Now, you also need to realize during Hezekiah's reign, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. OK, so just if you're if you're taking notes and really following us along here during Hezekiah's reign, that is when that northern kingdom, because the northern kingdom under all those kings, you know, 
They were evil, you know. I believe just about all of them was evil except, uh, except uh, the one, and he was like mixed. But uh, God had sent prophets to him and warned the northern kingdom. They wouldn't listen, and in the process of time, they fell to the Assyrians. And that happened during Hezekiah's reign in the south in Judah. And, uh, uh, but, but with that being said, the Assyrian king Sennacherib, are you glad you're not named Sennacherib? You know, I still have trouble spelling that. <laughs> and my spell checker on my computer won't even spell that right. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> but King Sennacherib came. Now, 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 what did Hezekiah do? He said, we're not paying you money no more. We're not going to pay the Assyrians any money. That was a good thing what Hezekiah did. But uh, Sennacherib came against Hezekiah because Hezekiah said, hey, no more money is going to be coming your way. And that made Sennacherib mad. You can understand that. And Sennacherib came against Hezekiah. And guess what Hezekiah did? He apologized to Sennacherib. Now, even though he was a good king, he wasn't perfect. And it was a mistake he made. You know, even good people make mistakes. And he, he made a mistake. And he paid Sennacherib tribute um, and, and money. He started paying him, you know, because Sennacherib threatened Hezekiah. If you don't pay me, you know, we're going to huff and puff and blow your house down. Although Hezekiah said worse than that to him, as we'll see. But be that as it may, uh, Sennacherib wanted more than 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. And uh, Hezekiah was frightened. And uh, what he did was Hezekiah used all the silver in the temple and the palace treasury <laughs> and he, he even stripped the gold from the doors and doorposts of the temple in return for Sennacherib's withdrawal. Think about that. He, he had the, he had the, I guess the priests and whatnot in there stripping the gold, you know, with, you know, like a putty knife or what. You know, stripping, have you ever stripped paint? I mean, I mean, everything in that temple pretty much was solid gold. And he, he was stripped, he stripped it down. I shouldn't really be laughing about it because it's not funny. But he, he stripped it down to pay off this evil king. And Hezekiah shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have done that. And, uh, and, and so what he did was he, he pays him off to get Sennacherib to withdraw. And so he cut a deal, essentially, with Sennacherib. He apologized to him. But you, knew, you know what happens? Sennacherib pursued Hezekiah anyway. What is a lesson we learn here? Don't negotiate with the devil. Amen. I said, don't negotiate with the devil. I said, don't negotiate with the devil. Don't apologize. See, Sennacherib was a type of the devil. And uh, don't, don't apologize to the devil. Don't cut a deal with the devil. And don't believe the devil. <laughs> I mean, don't believe him. He's a liar. Have you figured that out by now? He's a liar. And, and he's a double crosser. Did you know the devil's a double crosser? And, 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 and so what, what Hezekiah did was, is he, he said, we're not paying you no more money. Sennacherib threatens, so he, he gets intimidated and he starts paying him off to get him to back away. And he stripped all the gold off the, <laughs> out of the temple just to pay him off. And then Sennacherib pursued anyway. Don't apologize to the devil. Don't cut a deal with the devil. Don't pay him off because he is a double crosser. You need to realize that. He'll double cross you. Don't cut no deals with the devil. And don't apologize uh, to the devil. Don't back away from the devil. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so uh, Sennacherib continues to pursue Hezekiah, even though Hezekiah has paid him this vast sum of money in silver and gold. And so what happens is the uh, Sennacherib has his chief of staff terribly threaten Hezekiah and the people of Judah, you know, in Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem. And it's all in your reading assignment. I'm not going to cover it all. It's to take too long. But if you're reading, what, what did I give you for reading assignment? First, second Kings, yep. first, second Chronicles, first, second Samuel. Is that right? And so uh, it's all in there. But look at second Chronicles 32, verse seven. So with this threatening going on now against uh, Jerusalem, Hezekiah has a word to the people. As you remember, Sennacherib's got all this money and he's still, Hezekiah cut a deal with him and he's still pursuing in on him. And notice he says here in 2 Chronicles 32, 7, he says this to the people and it's good advice for all of us. 
He said, be strong and courageous. That's, that's good. That's, that's good. Don't you think that's good? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army. For there is a power far greater on our side. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. And that power would be God, right? Yes. In the name of the Lord Jesus, right? And uh, notice he says, he may have a great army, but they are merely men. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. Isn't it? Well, I like that, don't you? And Hezekiah's words greatly encouraged the people. It'd be worth coming just to get today, just to get that right there. Don't ever forget there's more that be with us than be with the enemy. The, the angels of God, the power of God, the name of Jesus. You understand that? And uh, uh, just, just like this is similar to what happened, remember, with Elisha and his servant. Remember, the servant was all concerned because they were surrounded by, I believe it was the Syrian army, if I'm not mistaken. And remember, uh, uh, Elisha prayed, uh, said to the Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Remember, and God opened his eyes and he saw in the spirit realm and the, the, the hills were full of the chariots of fire of Almighty God. Amen. So don't ever forget that. There's more that be with us than be with the, than be with the devil. And, uh, and so that's what Hezekiah told the people. But, uh, but guess what? Sennacherib's chief of staff, he continues to threaten the people. Notice 2 Kings 18, 19. 2 Kings 18, 19. New Living Translation. Then the Assyrian king's chief of staff told them to give this message to Hezekiah. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? That's what he asked Hezekiah. And I want to ask you that question today. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? I can answer that. I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm trusting in the Heavenly Father. I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit. I'm trusting in the Word of God. I'm trusting in the name of Jesus. I'm trusting in the armor of God. Amen. Glory to God. The power of God. How about you? Amen. And uh, what are you trusting in that makes you so confident? And then notice here. In 2 Kings 18.30, 2 Kings 18.30, I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. Uh, here's what this uh, chief of staff says. He says, and don't let Hezekiah give you that line about trusting in God, telling you God will save us. Well, I tell you what, I'll say this to the chief of staff. I like the line that Hezekiah told. I like his line. Do you like his line? Yes. I like his line. But you see, that's what the devil will do. He'll come along and say, you know, just what he said right here. He said, to he-, he said, don't let Hezekiah give you that line about trusting in, in, in trusting in God, telling you God will save us. Don't don't believe that. That's what the devil will tell you. Don't believe that. God won't save you. He he won't. And, and if you read on in here, he- he'll 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 just demean God and 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 people that trusted in God and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through it all for the sake of time, but just summing it up. That's what the devil will come and tell you. Don't trust in God. God's not going to help you this time. He might have helped you last time, but he's not going to help you. This time, I tell you what, the same God that helped you last time will help you this time and will help you the next time. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Is that right? Is that right? And uh, and so God will help you. He will help you. So don't believe don't believe the devil when he tells you that God's not going to help you, because I'm here today to tell you by the authority of the word of God that God will help you. You understand that? But that's what the that's what the devil will do. And the chief of staff of Assyria was very threatening. I mean, very threatening. And if you, if I took the time, he, I mean, he's just threatening. The devil's a threatener. Did you know that? He'll threaten you and threaten you and threaten you. But you know, if you know who you are in Christ, you don't have to be afraid of him. Because if he comes up against you, he comes up, the, up against that shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Is that right? But, but the devil's a threatener, and that's what he was doing here. And he threatened, he threatened Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem so badly... That look at 2 Kings 19.1, 2 Kings 19.1, because remember Sennacherib, Sennacherib had sent his chief of staff and some of his other representatives, I guess it was, out there, uh, you know, to Jerusalem to threaten Hezekiah. And so look at 2 Kings 19.1 in the Message Bible. When Hezekiah heard, heard it all, he too ripped his robes apart and dressed himself in rough burlap. That was, a, that was symbolic of humbling himself. And he went to the temple of God. It's a good thing he opened it back up, right? Is that right? That's where you need to go when you're in trouble. 
uh, to the temple of God and to the house of God, you know, to, to the local church in the time we live here. And he went to the temple of God and he sent, uh, and it notes his representatives, he sent all of Hezekiah's representatives, all of them dressed in this rough burlap to the prophet Isaiah, because remember, he's been threatened now by the chief of staff, you know. We're going to huff and puff, blow your house down. We're all, worse than that. And so he, Hezekiah sends his people to the prophet Isaiah for help. That's good to go to the man of God, isn't it? See what he has to say. Go see what the pastor has to say about it. And, uh, and so they went to the prophet Isaiah. Verse 3, they said to him, a message from Hezekiah. Here's what Hezekiah, here's what Hezekiah said about the threats. He said, this is a black day, a terrible day, doomsday. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that? It's a black day. It's a dark day. It's doomsday. And he says, maybe God, your God, has been listening to the blasphemous speech of the, you know, of the chief of staff who was sent by, uh, by Sennacherib to humiliate the living God. Maybe God, your God, won't let him get by with such talk. And, and you, maybe you will lift up prayers for what's left of these people, you know. That's the message Hezekiah's servants delivered to Isaiah. But I read all that to get to this. Look at what Isaiah's response was. He said, tell your master, tell Hezekiah... God's word. Here it is. Don't be at all concerned about what you've heard from the king of Assyria's bootlicking errand boys. I like that. I like that. That's why I read it in the Message Bible. I like that. Don't you like that? Yes. I mean, when, when the devil's threatening, you know, and we're, and we're like Hezekiah, we're in, intimidated. How many of you know God's not intimidated? The Bible says that God sits in the, on his throne in the heavens, you know, and laughs, you know. So, so God, Hezekiah might have been threatened uh, and felt, uh, uh, you know, a little anxious and a little intimidated by Sennacherib, but God was not at all intimidated. He said, he said, tell Hezekiah, don't be at all concerned about what you've heard from the king of Assyria's bootlicking errand boys. I like that. I like, don't you like that? Yes. I like that. But you know what? Sennacherib further threatened Hezekiah with a letter. Further threatened him with a letter. And so Hezekiah, if you, if you read the whole story, I don't have time. You can read it on your own. But Sennacherib further threatened Hezekiah with a letter. And Hezekiah took Sennacherib's letter back to the temple and laid it out before the Lord and read it to the Lord. So there you have Hezekiah now in the temple reading to the Lord this letter. And in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 20, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 20, New Living Translation, then King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, both cried out in prayer to God in heaven. So you've got not only Hezekiah praying, but you got, you got Isaiah praying, okay? And did you know a lot of people want the pastor to do all the praying for him? Did you know that? But learn a lesson here. Not only do you see Isaiah praying, but you also see Hezekiah praying. You see them both praying. I've been pastoring quite a long time, and I've known that, I've known this, I've learned this. A lot of times people want the pastor to do their praying for them. Now, I need to pray, all right. I need to pray for you, all right. But you need to do your own praying, you see. And when we pray and come together, you know, if two on earth would agree is touching anything they'd ask, it'd be done for them. You know, there's power and agreement and so forth, as long as it lines up with the word of God. Point here is, is Hezekiah and Isaiah are praying about this because you got Sennacherib out there and he's ready to <laughs> puff and puff and blow the house down. OK, and the Lord sent it. Now, now watch this. Now, God's not intimidated. So they're praying. Now, watch what happens when we pray. I tell you what, our faith, if we'll pray in faith, if we'll pray in, the, in faith in line with the word of God, in, in line with the will of God, I tell you what, God will start moving. I tell you what, he really will. And notice what happens here. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed the Assyrian army with all its commanders and officers. Isn't that wonderful? And, and, and 2 Kings 19, you don't have to turn there, but 2 Kings 19 brings out that, that the angel of the Lord in that one night killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Think about that. I don't want to mess with that angel, do you? Absolutely not. And uh, I tell you what, can you see why God wasn't intimidated at all by Sennacherib? He had one angel there that he could send and wiped out, <laughs> wiped out 185,000 in one night, just leveled them. Isn't that, isn't that something? And we serve that same God. I said, we serve that same God. I said, we serve that same God. And he's got more than one angel. Did you know that? He's got an innumerable company of angels. Did you know that? And, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So Sennacherib, verse 21. So Sennacherib was forced to return home in disgrace 
to his own land. Well, I'll say so. And when he entered the temple of his God, uh, this was a false God, uh, some of his own sons killed him there with the sword. So, I mean, this guy that's shooting his mouth off, you got to watch it. I tell you what, just in a short time, he's dead and Hezekiah's not. And 185,000 others are dead and Hezekiah's not. Isn't that wonderful? And actually, uh, if you're a student of archaeology, there was an artifact of Sennacherib that was found. Listen to this. And, uh, and, and he gave an account of what happened here. And in his account, he said that he had Hezekiah and Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. But that's where his account stopped. He didn't give the rest of the story. And of course not. He didn't want to tell how he got sent back with his tail between his legs. Is that? I mean, you need to realize that the devil won't always tell you the whole story. He'll just tell you the parts he wants you to hear. But I tell you what, we need to go into the Bible and find out the whole story, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And if you read, the, if you read uh, Sennacherib's account, uh, he leaves off where he had Hezekiah surrounded, you know, caged like a bird. But if you read the truth of the word of God, we, we just read what happened. The angel of the Lord came in there, dropped those 185,000 down. Next thing you know, Sennacherib's dead. I tell you what, I'm going to believe the word of God and get the rest of the story. How about you? Glory. God. Now look at verse 22. It says, uh, that's how the Lord rescued Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from King Sennacherib of Assyria and from all the others who threatened them. So there was peace throughout the land. From then on, King Hezekiah became highly respected among all the surrounding nations and many gifts for the Lord arrived at Jerusalem with valuable presents for King Hezekiah too. So it, see, it looked like a dark doomsday. When see, Hezekiah thought it was a dark doomsday, but God can turn it around. I tell you, he can turn it around if we'll, if we'll, just, if we'll just pray and, and believe God. Amen. Is that right? Isn't that right? That, that's right, isn't it? Glory to God. Now, let's, let's, let's go on here. Uh, about this same time, something happened. King Hezekiah, while this was all going on, and I can't exactly pinpoint exactly when this happened, but in, this, in along about this same time, King Hezekiah became deathly sick. He fell terminally ill. And he had no heir to the throne. And notice in uh, 2 Kings 20 verse 1, 2 Kings 20 verse 1, New King James Version, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now that's not what you ever want to hear. Because God's talking here. <laughs> and this is a death sentence from God. You don't want to hear that. I mean, it's one thing when the devil tells you you're going to die. I mean, that can, you know, you know, we know the devil's a liar and we can stand on the word of God. But what are you going to do when God tells you you're going to die? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to show you how to turn a death sentence from God right here in the Bible. Now, this is good. It's worth coming to church for right here because Hezekiah turned a death sentence from God, you know. And notice here now the sickness wasn't from the Lord, but he fell ill and God told him you're going to die. Set your house in order. Not things you want to hear, but notice how it was turned. Notice what happened. Hezekiah, verse 2, turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord saying. See, when, you, when you're facing this kind of a thing, start praying. Just start praying. And he says this, he starts pleading his case. He says, remember now, verse three, O Lord, I pray how I walk before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you'll go up to the house of the Lord. So the, the thing was turned, wasn't it? And he said, and I'll add to your days 15 years. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful, isn't it? He pled his case. He went before the Lord and pled his case. He went before the Lord and pled his case. And he turned the situation. He turned a death sentence from God. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. He went and prayed with sincerity of heart. You can see that with those tears. And God said, surely I'll heal you and so forth. And I'll add 15 years.
Now, uh, people have asked me about this over the years, you know, why God would send Isaiah in there with that message and then in just a short time, it looks like God changed his position. But really, it wasn't so much that God changed his position. Really, it was Hezekiah. There was apparently some sort of a change in his heart. I think you can see that. And as a result of that change in his heart, then God changed the situation. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And he had 15 years added. And I'll deliver you. And this city from the land of the king of Assyria, which of course God did, I'll defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. There was a boil that was going to kill him. And now I notice here that God used medicine to heal this guy. So why didn't God just use the power of God? I don't know. You'll have to ask God. I believe in, in the power of God. I also believe in good hospitals, good doctors, and good medicines. I believe God has given us good hospitals, good doctors, and good medicines. And I think we ought to do both. We ought to, we ought to when hit, sickness would hit our body, we turn to God first. We look to Him. And then uh, sometimes the power of God will just hit us and heal us, you know. Thank God for it. And sometimes we, we turn, you know, we turn to medical science and God will use that to heal us. Either way, healing is a good deal, isn't it? And in this case, God uh, used medicine. God's not against medicine. I believe medicine comes from the Lord. You know, Amen. Good hospitals, good doctors, good medicines. So, so, but remember that king we studied earlier? Uh, I think his name was Asa, if I'm remembering it correctly. Remember, he got in trouble because he only turned to the doctors. Right. Remember that? He only turned to the doctors. He didn't turn to God. Remember? Yeah. But, but so, so here's the lesson. Sickness hits your body. Turn to God first. Look to God. You know, there's a lot of things that doctors and medicines and hospitals can't help you of. Do you know that? So always turn to God first. But then sometimes, certainly, God will use good hospitals, doctors, and medicines. And he often does. And so let's take advantage of both of them. So here there was a lump of figs. They laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I'll go up to the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This is a sign... This is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down from the sundial of Ahaz. God can maneuver time, can't he? And he did it as a sign to Hezekiah and so it went backwards you know he did something God did something he did something similar remember when Joshua was fighting that battle remember how many remembers that and he need more sunlight remember that and, and, and so, so God uh, he, he stopped things and for I believe it was 23 hours and uh, uh, I think it was 23 hours and 20 minutes with, with Joshua he needed more sunlight have you ever needed more sunlight at the end of the day I don't know if they had daylight savings time back there then or not but I tell you what God outranks daylight savings time is that right Joshua needed more light and so Joshua prayed and, and commanded the sun to stand still the moon and all that and God I don't know how he did it don't ask me it's above my pay grade but God stopped it for this everything from moving I don't know how he did it for about a day but God's God he can do that kind of thing is that right he did that in Joshua's day and then here of course, uh, for, for Hezekiah, uh, it went backward 10 degrees, about 40 minutes. And, uh, uh, and so somewhere in there, there's an hour. I don't know. We either got an extra hour or there's an hour missing, however you want to figure it up. But God took care of it. Can you say amen? amen? And it did happen. It was a great sign to Hezekiah. And he lived and he lived 15 more years. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. But now let's close. In the next few minutes was something that I find very interesting. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 24. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 24. Now, it's going to kind of sum up in two verses what we just read in several verses. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. And we just read about that. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him for his heart was lifted up. Now some people say that that he had gotten into pride prior to that boil showing up and that's that the boil came because of the pride and then he repented in his prayer. We see that with the tears and that, that could well have happened. Could well have. 
But it, it, as I study it, it almost looks to me like, and I think it's fairly clear, that after he was healed, there was pride in his heart. Because prior to him falling sick, he was there in the temple, you know, with that letter before the Lord and dressed in the burlap. And so, I mean, as, as I study it, and I could be wrong on this, but it looks like that after he got healed, there was an issue with pride. Now, it could have been before, but it looks like it was after. Now, you wouldn't think after somebody got healed that they'd have an issue with pride. You know what I'm, what I'm talking about? You, in other words, let's read it here. He said he did, it said his heart was lifted up. He did not repay according to the favor shown him. His heart was lifted up. And apparently there might not have been, he might not have been as thankful as he should have been for being healed. Can you imagine that? Now he's a good king. What is a lesson? We have to learn a lesson here that when God delivers us from something, let's be careful that we don't get into pride. And, and, and I don't know how, why this is, but I've watched this in people in 27 years of pastoring. It seems like after they've had a great victory, God's given them a great victory for some reason. And I don't understand it, but they're not as thankful a lot of times and they don't continue to serve God as they should. I remember one man was miraculously healed of bladder cancer and, 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 and he stopped coming to church and stopped studying the word of God and eventually it came back on him and he died. I don't understand why, if God gave us a great victory, why we wouldn't rejoice and be happy and, and, and why would we be lifted up in pride? I, I, I tell you, what, if you're taking notes, this is a lesson we need to learn. God gives you a great victory. Don't get lifted up in pride. Yep. Is that worth coming to church for just to get that? Yes. And so his heart was lifted up. And as a result, the Bible said, wrath was looming over him. God's judgment was looming over him in Judah and Jerusalem. But there's good news. Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. So that's good. See, he was a good king. And he and, and, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, uh, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Now it came, but it came later. Sometimes God would do that. We've talked about that with these other kings. That they wouldn't see it, but it, they'd see the judgment later on. And then verse 20 says, so, so, so be watchful. God gives you a great victory. Don't get lifted up in pride. Stay humble. Now, as good news, he did humble himself. Now, some people teach that this was, was in line and more, more set with that, that boil and whatnot. But it, it could have been. But I, I, as I study, it looks like after he got healed, he had this problem with pride. So be that as it may, just watch pride. You know, pride is something you can have and not even know it. Did you know that? Yep. And pride's a, pride is a bad thing. Pride goes before a fall, haughty spirit before struck, destruction. Is that right? You know, some people, uh, they can have terminal things growing in their body that's cancerous, that's going to kill them, and it's there, and they don't even know it. Did you know that? Well, pride is spiritually that way. You can have pride and it's there and, and, and a lot of times you, ha you have it, nobody knows it. I mean, everybody else knows you've got it except you, you know, a lot of times, you know. Have you ever met anybody you could see they were prideful and everybody knew they were prideful except the person that had the pride, you know. But it's something you can have and not even know it. So judge yourself, look at yourself, examine yourself, stay humble. You understand. So anyway... Uh, so uh, the good news was that at least he humbled himself. Now notice verse 27. I'm almost finished, but let me, let me finish this up because I want to finish Hezekiah today. Uh, notice verse 27. It's an interesting thing here. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasures for silver, gold, for precious stones, for spices, shields, and all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock and for folds of flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself, possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for he had given him, uh, for God had given him much prosperity. He, he was a good king, you see. He sought the Lord. And so he's very rich. Now, this same Hezekiah, and then it talks about that water, that water, that water duct or that water tunnel that he built, verse 30. So you can read about that. Verse 31. But here's something interesting. However, regarding the ambassadors of the, uh, uh, the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land. So after he was healed of that boil, Babylon, the king of Babylon sends envoys over to check on Hezekiah to inquire about the great, the great miracle. Now, the miracle that they were mainly, I guess, coming to, to check on was they, they'd, heard, they'd heard Hezekiah was miraculously healed. 
But there was also that sundial thing. That's a miracle worth checking on, don't you think? Also, uh, Sennacherib's 185,000 laying there dead. That's something worth coming to check on. So anyway, they came over to check on Hezekiah from Babylon. Now listen, very interesting. And it's interesting when, when those ambassadors came, the Bible says something interesting here in verse 31. God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. Well, now, how many of you know that God knows everything? He knows everything. But, but what he was doing here, and God does this sometimes, he'll, he'll do something to reveal something that, he'll, he, he did this, God knows everything, but he did this, it's like when he asked Adam, where are you? How many of you know God knew where Adam was? But the real question there, did Adam know where he was? And so he, God did this here to reveal something that was in Hezekiah's heart. And again, what have I taught you in this series? You gotta watch your heart as you get older in chronological years. Now, it's interesting here, God withdrew from him. Now, it does not mean that God left him. Remember how God left Saul, King Saul? God didn't leave Hezekiah like he left Saul. I put it this way. Have you ever seen a parent that had a good child, real good child? And, and when the parent's in the room, that child is going to be extra good. But the parent steps out of the room, and now the child knows the parent isn't there anymore. And the parent veers around the... How many remember, you know, you know what I mean? Veers around to see how the child's really going to act when the parent's not there. I just thought of a funny story. Remember Dennis the Menace right at the end? Dennis the Menace, now he wasn't a good kid. But right at the end of Dennis the Menace, remember? And, 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 I, and they were showing the credits, you know, going through. And Diane and me, we're getting ready to walk out of the movie theater. And all of a sudden, there's this, this mean office lady there, remember? And, and, and she was sitting there. And Dennis was supposed to be at Mr. Wilson's house. But he hit Mr. Wilson with the flaming marshmallow. Remember that? And so Mr. Wilson makes him go to the daycare. How I many remember, remember that? And, and, and Dennis is at the daycare. And his mother's working down the hall, you know. And she comes up, you know. And she's going to check on Dennis, and there was this mean lady there that had get, been giving Dennis's mother trouble, you know, and she veers around to look at Dennis, and, and she sees that Dennis is sitting there with, the, with this, this mean lady, and so the mother just kind of, Dennis's mother just kind of backs off, because she knows what's going to happen to this mean office lady, because you got to deal with Dennis. Remember, the next thing you know, you know that lady's there, she's making copies, remember that? And she gets her scarf a little too close to the copy machine, how many remembers that? And, and Dennis, he just couldn't resist a button, you know, and he hits the button, remember? Remember that? And that button, he hits a button and that copy machine takes that woman's scarf and pulls her face down, you know, down on that copy machine. And the next thing you see is those paper, her copies of those papers coming out with her face mashed against that copy machine. That's hilarious, you know. Don't you think that's funny? If you saw it, I'd tell you it's really funny. So that's what, I don't know why I thought about that. But be that as it may, what God did was, now, now, now Dennis wasn't a good child, but Hezekiah was, but God backed off from him and like stepped in the other room just to see how Hezekiah was going to act when God wasn't looking, so to speak. You okay with that? So God didn't leave him, leave him. He just kind of walked in the other room. Let's put it that way. But now watch this. He did this to reveal, now the interesting thing here as I close. What happened here, this is fascinating. Now, let's go to 2 Kings 20, and it gives us more on these, these envoys that came from Babylon. Let's see what Hezekiah did. He had all these riches. Now, watch this. 2 Kings 20, verse 12. Watch your heart as you get older. Now, watch this. Hezekiah's getting older. At that time, king of Babylon, gives his name, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah was attentive to them. So here comes these Babyl Babylonians. They come over to check on Hezekiah. Now, don't you think if you'd just been healed of a terminal illness, don't you think the first thing you would do is start telling? They, they got over there. They came over there. They said, we heard about this great sign. Don't you think Hezekiah would start telling them about the great sign and how he got healed and how God turned the sundial back 10 degrees and all that? Huh? Yeah. Don't you think? He didn't talk about that. He didn't talk about none of that. Notice what he did do. He showed them all the house of his treasures. The silver and gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all his armor, all his armory. All of his defense capabilities, his armory, his armory. He showed him, the, the, Hezekiah showed these Babylonians the, arm, the armor, the, the, the war department. Not just the silver and the gold, but the armory. 
and all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing, watch this, there was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. You see pride there? But you also see not being too smart either. Now, I'm not saying he was dumb. I'm just saying this is not a really good king, but not a smart move here. There was nothing he didn't show them. Verse 14, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, thank God he'll send a prophet. He'll send a man of God. He'll send a pastor or somebody. And he said, he said to him, Isaiah said, what did these men say and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said they came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. You know, the Bible said, Jesus, our Lord said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Is that, is that right? And the swine here, they were unbelievers. The Babylonian type. This is a type of the devil. The devil comes over to your house. Don't show him everything you got. Lest they trample, if you cast your pearls before swine, they'll trample you under feet. They'll trample them under feet and then tear you to pieces. And we'll see generations later, some generations later, these same Babylonians came back and they, and, and, and they took Judah and Jerusalem into Babylonian captivity. And I believe this is where it started right here. Because he showed them everything, all the, all the goodies, all the gold, all the silver, all that, and then and revealed his war secrets to them, all of it. My uncle told my mom something. His uncle Grant was his name. He told my mom something, and my mom told me this many times. She said, don't tell everything you know. That's good advice. That was worth coming to church just to get that. Don't tell everything you know. Now, that, I'm not saying that if we know the truth, we should hide the truth. I'm not talking about that. But we don't have to tell everybody everything we know. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Sometimes you can get yourself in trouble doing that. And, uh, and, and I've had to learn that in my life. When I was younger, I'd tell people everything I knew. Just tell them everything I know. And it, it cost me some. You don't tell everything you know. You don't, play, uh, you don't play old maid and show your cards to the enemy. The people you're playing old maid with, you know. You don't, know. You don't play poker and show... Now, now everybody understands. Talk about poker. <laughs> you don't show your hand, do you? You don't tell everything you know. Right? You don't tell everything you know. He told, he told everything he knew. You know, uh, and he showed them all... The, and you see the pride of his heart. Show all these goodies... You know, I, 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 I have it in my notes. The Lord wanted me to say it, so I'll say it. You know, there's a few preachers on television. If you watch them, all they do is talk about how much money they got. Right. And they're, they're showing the world, everybody, how much money they're talking. They can't go, fi- this one guy, he can't go, he can't go, out because I've clocked him. He can't go five minutes without telling how big his house is, how much money he's got. Hezekiah made that same mistake, didn't he? And down the road, it cost Hezekiah. Now, not in his lifetime, but later on, it cost because the Babylonians came and took everything. Anyway, verse 16, Isaiah said, Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Now, here's what Isaiah had to say about this. He said, Behold, the days are coming, verse 17, when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon, nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And it all started right there. He told him everything he knew. Don't tell everything you know. Don't tell everything you know. And they'll take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you'll beget. And they'll be eunuchs in the, look up what a eunuch is sometime, in the, in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, now listen to this. You can see Hezekiah's heart is, it, there's, there's something not quite right there. He's a good king, but watch this. See, God pulled back into the other room, so to speak, to see what was really in his heart. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. Now here's what Hezekiah is saying. He's saying to Isaiah, what I hear you saying is good. Well, that's not good. I said, it's not good, but Hezekiah is saying it's good. Why did Hezekiah say it's good? Because he said, at least there'll be peace and truth while I'm alive. You see, there's something not quite right there. Isaiah, there's no real care for his descendants, no real care for future generations. That's a symptom of pride. As long as I'm going to be okay, it doesn't matter what happens to, to my children or children's children. I mean, do you see that there? That's not good. So Hezekiah, as good as he was, 
He still had some issues, didn't we? Didn't he? Just like all of us. He had some issues. But he was a good king, one of the best, if, if not arguably the best. And at, at a future time, he died. No doubt he went to paradise, Abraham's bosom. He was a saved man, no question about that. His uh, body was honored in burial. And then his son, his son comes to power. That son that he had after he got those 15 more years, he had a son named Manasseh. And he comes to power. Hezekiah, great, good king. Manasseh, guess what? One of the most evil, wicked kings of all. We'll talk about him next week. And he'll come to power. And it's a tragic reign at first. He had a great story of God's goodness, a great story of God's means of leading to repentance, and his power and willingness to forgive and restore those who truly repent. You don't want to miss Manasseh, because I tell you what, of all of them, he's, I tell you, we can learn a lot about how God is a good God and how he forgives, how he restores, and how he'll get us to repent and how he'll move in ways to get people to repent. It'll be interesting next week. If you're out there today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to invite you to repent of your sins and cry out to the Lord Jesus. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So call on his name. You'll miss hell. You'll make heaven when you die and God will make your life worth living in the meantime. Hope you enjoyed this today. Thanks for being with us. God bless you. Bye bye.